Okay, there we go. Hello everyone, how's it going? Team here and this is BXGS Weekly episode 52, bringing you all the best JavaScript news of the week in the podcast form as usual. We do not have that many articles today for whatever reason, but we do have quite a bunch of new demos and libraries and things like this. And uh, I also got some uh, interesting and silly tidbits for you. So I guess let's get started. The first article we have today is how do I create thumbnails when I upload a video? Amazon Web Services Lambda. So this is a tutorial on using Amazon Web Services Lambda and S3 buckets to generate uh, thumbnails for the videos. It is not, uh, well, it does spend quite a lot of time talking about specifically Amazon Web Services things. You can also use the same recipe without Amazon Web Services. So if you ever wanted to generate thumbnails uh, for your videos from Node.js, you can just have a look at this article, uh, disregard basically anything that talks about the Amazon Web Services, and just use the code that uses essentially FFmpeg uh, for slicing the random image from the video and saving it as a thumbnail, right? So it's a very straightforward approach, but it's a very nice tutorial that actually walks you through, uh, first of all, uh, in quite a lot of details through Amazon Web Services stuff, and second of all, through using FFmpeg from Node.js by using this spawn function, but nonetheless, you know, it's uh, it can be a bit tricky to do. So it's a very good tutorial. Do check it out if that topic sounds interesting. Next article we got here is mocking with callbacks and jest. I actually would call it rather just, you know, introduction to mocking with jest rather than callbacks because it just, it doesn't really talk about callbacks specifically, more about the mocking things with jest, which is, a quite powerful thing and you know if you ever work with it you know that uh, you can do quite a lot of very cool things with it if you never heard about mocking if you are unsure as to how that works and this is actually a very good tutorial that uh, shows you how to mock specifically the data retriever api in your <clears throat> apologies in your react application right using the jest mock method and uh, essentially mocking the responses in a ways that you want them to work um, I've been like just have been one of my favorite test runners for quite some time and I've been using mocking quite heavily in some of the projects that essentially require you to, well, fake a lot of things, right? It can be useful in a lot of cases. Um, one of the most frequent cases that I have essentially is the rate limited API, third party API that I have to use. And if you try, you know, to do it in CI, you're obviously going to hit those rate limits way frequently. For example, I had the problem with GitHub because their API is very heavily limited. And if you try to do requests from the GitHub API, you will hit the limits, well, almost immediately, actually. My tests were failing and I couldn't figure out what the hell is going on because it was working fine locally. Turns out it was the API limits and the CI server were just already basically blocked or nearly blocked. And uh, yeah, mocking essentially solves this as one of the problems. So if you're interested about mocking in Jest, make sure to check this article out. It gives you a very good introduction. Uh, hey, Bakao, welcome to the stream. All right, continuing, we got alternatives to JSX, an overview, a pretty nice one of uh, alternative ways of writing React JSX, uh, or rather React without JSX, right? So starting with a very basic one, as in just taking React Create Element and rewriting everything by hand and going to a simple renaming, which makes it a bit nicer. And I think one of the first techniques that you've actually seen, going to HyperScript, which makes this sort of renaming even more convenient because it allows you to use aliases for classes and stuff like this. Then going to HTM, which in my opinion is absolutely awesome way of doing it because you literally just use template literal and write the same JSX as you did before and it just works. So yeah, there's also list like syntax and all that kind of stuff. But if you are curious in using React without uh, JSX, do check this article out. It is pretty good. Uh, Harry Hoodie, those tabs. Yeah, I mean, that's not even the most we had on this podcast, I believe. So, you know, this is kind of normal for me. And this is typically about twice less than what I gather over the duration of the week. So I throw out half of the content that is not just up to par uh, or, you know, at least what I consider to be interesting enough to be here. So yes, yes, this is how it usually goes. All right. 
Next article we got here is a CPU and IO performance diagnostics in Node.js. This is a tutorial on how to essentially generate the heat maps and CPU uh, dumps from the Node.js and then analyze them using a variety of tools. If you are familiar with stuff like Flamescope and uh, what was the name of the CPU thing? Man, I completely forgot about that. So there's this another thing. I think maybe you can just fit it to Flamescope as well. But um, nonetheless, so it's basically a tutorial on how to generate those flame graphs and then analyze them using a variety of tools to figure out where exactly do you have the problems with uh, the CPU or IO, right? So this is, this is very easy actually to do in the browser because you just literally fire up the Chrome DevTools and then you can just generate those uh, profile um, profiling profiles, is that what you call them? What was it? Uh, snapshot, yes, and then stop profiling. How's it called? Okay, you know what, just, yeah, performance profiles. Let's just call it this way. But with Node.js, it's a bit more trickier than that, and this article does a pretty good job of essentially walking you through how to set this up and how to load these profiles later on in uh, tools like Flames, uh, God damn it, Flamescope to actually analyze them. So if you ever worked with Node.js and had some CPU or IO performance issues, do check this article out. It will guide you through everything you have to know about uh, debugging those essentially. Next article we got here is how do we react from Aurelia team? So this is uh, kind of a response to a tweet by uh, Sebastian Markvich who said that, um, so essentially here's the quote of the tweet, you may have noticed that the most other frameworks don't have higher order components, render props or anything like React children. Those account for a lot of differences between React and other frameworks. How would you solve these cases if you had to switch to any other framework essentially? And the whole article is Aurelia, uh, <laughs> for some reason it's really hard for me to say Aurelia properly. So the whole article is Aurelia team uh, answering the pro those questions and saying how the Aurelia solves those specific problems that arise when you don't have higher order components, render props and React children. It is an interesting read. Um, I like I never used Aurelia, so I can't really comment much on it, but it was um, kind of curious to see how exactly they can address all of those things without uh, using the same approach as the React team. So it's always fascinating to read through stuff like this. So if you have any interest in Aurelia, maybe you're already using it, or maybe you're considering switching to it from uh, React, do check it out. It gives some pretty interesting insight into how the Aurelia works. Uh, if you have no interest in Aurelia, then well, there's basically nothing super cool here. I mean, it's it's interesting to read about the internals, but you know, it's, it's very Aurelia specific stuff. And unless you are very heavily into front end frameworks, you won't really find anything interesting there. Right, next article we got here is use Docker to create a node development environment. Uh, so this, this one is, um, I wouldn't call it controversial, but here's the thing. So the article itself talks about using Docker to create a ubiquitous environment that you can reuse anywhere. You don't have to install Node.js, NPM and so on and so forth. You just use Docker container as base and then you mount your current folder into it and share the local files and develop this way, right? It sounds like a great plan. We tried it. Uh, it's actually multiple companies that I worked for and it never quite worked out for us. <laughs> Yes, so here's the thing. While Docker is an amazing technology and allows you to deploy things in very simple way, right? It works really well on Linux. So like if you take Linux and if you take this approach with Docker and packaging everything and running everything through Docker, on Linux machines, it works amazingly well and you will have a really good experience, right? So it, it's, there's very little overhead and so on and so forth. Now, the problem starts when you have a dev team that uses Macs and that uses Windows machines and you sort of, okay, you say, okay, now we're gonna abstract everything into Docker and it's gonna be way nicer for everyone. Well, it turns out not so much. There is a bunch of problems. Like for example, on Macs, there is a known bug for Docker machine that makes the volumes be two to three times slower than your normal access to file system. So if you wrap your thing into Docker machine, and you mount a volume to your Node.js container, your hot reload will be two to three times slower than if you would just run it with Node.js, which, I mean, I guess for hot reload, you know, is not that critical, but say if you're working with databases and if you're working on a very large data set, that can be a game killer. So like imagine 
I think it was, um, what was it? Last time I worked on a data set that had almost 3 million entries and essentially running a complex queries on it. If I run it natively on macOS, so I just ran Postgres, right? It took, I think like an hour to do the query over all the entries. And if I would do the same running on Docker, it took about four hours, I believe. So it was very significant performance impacts. And that doesn't, you know, there's not just volumes, there's a lot more problems there. So while Docker is a viable, uh, let's call it this way, it's a viable option on Linux. If you have people working on different operating systems that are not Linux, you would rather stay away from that and just use Docker as a thing to test your app, right? So the CI works really well in Docker. And for example, like Circle CI is purely based around Docker, which is, you know, makes perfect sense. I, I think even Travis now is just Docker essentially. Testing in Docker makes sense and deploying in Docker makes sense. Developing inside of it can be very problematic. So I would advise against that. But if you know that you're working on Linux and if you know that you're only gonna be working on Linux, do check this article out. It does guides you through essentially everything you need to know to set up the development environment inside of Docker. All right, continuing, we got Node.js task runners. Are they right for you? So this article talks about the task runners that I don't know if a lot of people actually remember about them at this point, because they used to be a pretty big thing back in like 2010, 2011, 2012. Uh, if you remember, there was things like Gulp and Grunt and a bunch of other ones that did, well, ran tasks essentially, right? At one point, the Webpack came out and majority of them kind of became obsolete because Webpack does everything they did, but faster, better, and well, okay, not everything, but like 90% of cases were covered by Webpack because majority of people actually used Gulp, Grunt, and so on and so forth to build the front ends, like, you know, use SAS, use Babel, and then precompile it, then bundle it and throw it on a server. And then Webpack just does it for you as a one tool without any additional things and sometimes with a very basic configuration. Uh, nonetheless, if you still need task runners for something, uh, this article gives a nice introduction to all of them and sort of downsize and upsize of each one of them. I personally prefer either using shell scripts if I have something very complex, which rarely happens, or using package JSON and just use the run scripts, right? This is about 90% of time it covers everything I wanna, I wanna do. And if it doesn't, then well, I likely just take something like Webpack or a rollup that basically has plugins for everything I need. Other than that, yeah, I, I don't really know. If you're familiar with Gulp Grunt and all the other tools that you can use to run tasks, uh, build tasks specifically, then well, this article won't give you anything new. All right, next thing we got here is taming complex React state with union types. Um, this is a TypeScript article talking about union types in React and using them as I have zero knowledge of TypeScript, essentially, I can't really comment anything on it. So if you are using TypeScript, make sure to check it out. If not, then uh, it seems to be a very advanced article. So I don't know if it's any good for the beginners. I'll just, you know what, I'll just tell you that this exists. Check it out if, if that sounds interesting. That's basically all I can say. Uh, hey, Mataputra, welcome to the stream. All right, continuing, we got implementing JavaScript promises in 70 lines of code. This is a tutorial that shows you how to build your own promise um, class, I guess, in just 70 lines of code. I mean, promises are a very straightforward thing. So I think uh, if you still don't understand how promises work, if you get confused by the whole then and catch and you know all that kind of stuff, do check this article out. It basically breaks down the way promises work line by line by re-implementing them. It's a very good write-up. It's a very simple concept, uh, as in the promises themselves. And I think if you just go through this, you will understand completely how they work. I don't think you need to implement promises yourself right now. The native promises are way better than any third-party library, and they will be better over time, right? Because V8 team always improves the performance of anything in the core. And there's no way that the third party libraries are gonna keep up with that. Although I actually haven't checked. It was quite amusing because when the native promises were released originally for like V8, the third party libraries for promises were actually way faster than the native ones. And Bluebird was one of the mo like the fastest ones. I'm actually quite curious 
Bluebird JS. I'm quite curious how is it now. I believe they had a performance thing somewhere here. Uh, performance. There we go. Uh, pull requests are particularly unfinished. It's no longer here. Why is it no longer here? Okay. Um, Bluebird. Uh, just bear with me. I want to test it. Promise benchmark. They had a benchmark somewhere. I remember that. There we go. We got the benchmarks. And is there now? First of all, when was this updated? November 2018. It's relatively fresh. Now here's the question, where is the native promises callbacks baseline. So callbacks are the fastest one as you would imagine. Uh, then promise native async await. So yeah, it seems like the bluebird is actually still faster than the native promises, which is <laughs> kind of incredible when you think about it. So there you go, maybe it's still worth it implementing your <laughs> own promise library. But all right, continuing. We got an article called react native, the journey of a beginner. This is actually a really good write up on uh, sort of yeah, a journey of a beginner who picked up react native and uh, build an app with it. And the article talks about all the related tools that were used and the problems that were encountered and the caveats that you have to keep in line, like different performance permissions in different Android versions, for example, right, because the old Android versions doesn't really allow you to request permissions dynamically, they have to be in your um, manifest. While the new ones don't care about the manifest, you have to explicitly ask for permissions requests and so on and so forth. There's like a bunch of different things here uh, and common pitfalls when managing the Xcode and other pain in asses. So if you are considering starting with the React Native or if you already started and you are in progress, make sure to read this. There is some very good pointers there, some non-obvious things and some uh, basically caveats to keep in mind when working with React Native. Uh, quite good, I would say. All right. Next article we got here is server side caching in ExpressJS, an introduction to server side caching. A very good one starting from, you know, talking what caching is, how they actually implement it uh, naively in memory, and then go into using a proper caching methods and then using the um, Redis and then using memcached, which is a way better solution for caching because it's build us around caching essentially uh, with ExpressJS to cache your stuff uh, using essentially a very lightweight uh, caching middleware. So if you're curious about ExpressJS and caching, do check this out. This basically has everything to get you started. Next article we got here is how to build a simple game in the browser with phaser tree and TypeScript. Uh, essentially a very basic tutorial on building a very, very, very simple starfall game where, you know, stars fall from the top screen and you have to catch them using your uh, player model. Using phaser and TypeScript, uh, you will build a very basic game. Yeah, like as I said, you know, stars fall and you kind of catch them and you miss some, which kind of makes sense. And uh, yeah, there's nothing super complicated here, but it's a very good starter for the TypeScript and phaser. So if you ever wanted to do something like this, do check it out. If you already work with phaser three, you won't really find anything new here. It is quite similar to some of the tutorials that I think phaser three has officially on their website, but uh, nonetheless, there is a bit more description in here related to the code snippets. All right. Um, next thing we got here is JavaScript quirks in one image from the internet. So um, the author here found this image um, in Google images, as he says, I'm not like, whatever. So the image basically lists majority of quirks that you have in JavaScript, like, you know, type of none is a number, true equals one, true equals one strictly is obviously false, because there is no type casting here. And yeah, like the comparison of floating point math, and then the different things like adding two arrays, adding array and object and so on and so forth. And the author goes and breaks down each one of those points and why exactly this happens. And the thing is that, well, JavaScript, even though this looks crazy when you look at first, all of that is actually in spec. Like this, the floating math stuff is not even JavaScript specific, it's just floating math uh, things. Isn't max and min inverted? Uh, no, that is actually, I think this is how it works. If I, well, I mean, we can try it, so let's see. So, uh, whoops, math min, right? So this go is gives you infinity and math max give you minus infinity. That is how it works. This might seems weird and uh, 
it definitely looks weird for you know if you if you never read the spec but again there is an explainer in the article of why exactly this happens a very good one and there's also very interesting discussion down below so if you're curious if you haven't seen some of those make sure to check it out there is good explanations of why exactly this happens and how exactly does this work and why does math max gives you minus infinity and so on and so forth so yeah it is it is very good deep dive into the quirks of javascript essentially all right um the last article we got here today is called we need chrome no more and it's another one of those uh let's talk about chrome dominance on the browser market and why is it bad for all of us and why relying on google as the sort of the dominant web leader is also bad for us which you know so here's the deal we already discussed this topic like three or four or five times in the past few months i think <laughs> Because I think it's almost nearly every podcast we got one of those articles that talks, hey, Chrome is bad, switch to other browser, blah, blah, blah. That makes total sense, right? Monopoly is always bad. There's there's no, no, never, I don't think there's ever been a monopoly that has been good for anything. Now, the problem is that there is no real competition to Chrome. As much as I want to like Firefox, it's just not as good as Chrome in some aspects. As much as I would like to like Safari and use it on my Mac, for example, right? It's just not as good as Chrome. It's actually lagging significantly behind Chrome in web features, like in JavaScript features, in, in like developer tools features. As much as I would like to use, I don't know, Firefox on mobile on my Android phone, right? There is a Firefox for Android. It is not very good. Like in comparison to Chrome, it feels sluggish, slow. Yes, it does allow me to run extensions. And it's actually one of the reasons that I was using it for quite some time because I could run uBlock Origin on Android. But uh, Brave, which is built on top of Chromium, has uBlock integrated and it's way faster because it's Chromium because I like... I get it, Monopoly is bad, but objectively there is not that much good competition, unfortunately, to Chrome. I kind of wish that, I don't know, maybe uh, Microsoft guys would do something good to us. Like they, they are using Chromium now. They're going to use Chromium forked version to build the Edge, next Edge version. Maybe they hard fork it and make a new version out of it. Maybe this will be the next big thing because, yeah, I kind of get it. It's bad, but come on, we want something good, right? You want to use crappy stuff just because there's a monopolist out there. Like, this doesn't make sense. But uh, nonetheless, yeah, the article has some good thoughts here and uh, pointers to as to what you can try using instead of Chrome, which is like, yeah, there's the... Brave, Vivaldi, um, Opera, and all of them have their own downsides. Like Brave is nice, but they don't allow you to run any plugins, which like, you know, why would I use that? I need my plugins. I have like a lot of them. But there you go. Um, I think it's important to have diversity, but man, the current browser landscape is just terrible. <laughs> Let's be honest, right? You got like Chrome that is amazing and you got Firefox that is kind of okay. They're getting better. They're getting a lot better since the engine rewrite, but they're still quite significantly behind, for example, DevTools in Chrome. But yeah, let's see what this year brings to us. All right, um, now we're coming to the smaller, awesome, tiny news tidbits and things about JavaScript. The first one here is remove and use CSS JavaScript code from your project. Uh, so this leverages the... Chrome uh, way to run the coverage on files and show you which lines of code are actually not used in your code. If you didn't know this exists, this does exist and it's quite awesome. And it leverages the puppeteer to automatically generate that um, report and then use the results to automatically remove the unused text from the files. It is a very naive approach because it literally just slices the ranges, which might result in some code breaking if I, um, at least my gut feeling tell me this, that you know you shouldn't really do that in this way. But I guess that will work for CSS without any problems. I'm not sure <laughs> for JS, they're probably going to break something. Nonetheless, it's a pretty nice approach. And uh, if you didn't know about that panel, do check it out. You can at least automate the generation of these reports using Puppeteer. And then, you know, had a good look at your code and man maybe manually decide to what exactly should be uh, removed from the build process. All right, next thing we got here is 
Uh, thing I didn't know, all of the GitHub's menus and dialogues actually work without JavaScript. And uh, this is kind of incredible because they have a lot of like, you know, pop-up dialogues, pop-up menus that you can actually fill and everything. And all of that works without JavaScript. And there is repositories that basically have source code for all of that. So if you are curious and how, is how to that was made, do check it out. It is actually very impressive and very cool. Next thing we got here is a tweet from you don't know JS uh, Twitter. Uh, by the way, if you didn't read the books yet, absolutely make sure to read them. They are fantastic. Now the um, there's an interesting JS nuance here. Uh, X, uh, so the plus plus operator uh, returns the current X and then increments it. So you you know this is exactly the model that I had mentally as well, as in you assign X to some variable and then do X plus one. But that's not actually that simple. So if you take x and say, okay, now we got five, and then we do x plus plus, it won't actually be 51, it will be six. Because what it does in reality by spec is actually first converts it to number and then does number plus one, which is kind of curious. So there you go. All right, next thing we got here is make Google fonts render faster. A thing for well, actually Chromium browsers because Firefox had this feature for ages. And what this code does is actually takes all your fonts, replaces the custom fonts with the whatever font is pre-installed, and then uh, prefetches them. And once the font is loaded, it will replace it with a custom font, right? So this is exactly uh, in Chrome. If you have custom fonts, the rendering looks like this GIF where you first see the rendered page without any text, which is bloody annoying, especially when you're on mobiles or on small internet. Now, the interesting thing is I still don't understand why the Chrome team doesn't do it in a way that Firefox team did it. So the Firefox have this behavior by default, uh, which is, you know, again, all the credit to Firefox team. Uh, when you load the page, you will see whatever the fonts are available in system. And once the custom fo uh, fonts get loaded, the page will be re-rendered using the custom font, which makes perfect sense. And for some reason, Chrome doesn't do that. So you can speed up your perceived rendering quite a bit by using this tiny uh, snippet, essentially. All right, next thing we got here is, uh, turns out JavaScript has string methods uh, like dot .bold, dot .bling, dot .italics, dot .link, and so on and so forth. And um, yes, David Walsh here did know about them, and I also did know about that, and it is kind of, kind of incredible. <laughs> I did not know that was a thing, but now you do. And um, I also do, and that's kind of awesome. People arguing about that. You mean the font rendering thing? I Like what, what to argue there? It's like, it's literally, it improves perceived performance a lot. Like, yeah, you've got stuff rendering immediately. And you don't, especially like try loading stuff on a slow 3G. That is painful when you got the custom fonts. But okay, continuing, we got a um, thread about the article from ZDNet from Jake Archibald, who is working for Google, and I believe uh, specifically on Google Chrome team. Uh, so he's talking about the service workers. There is an article that claims that the new browser attacks lets hackers run bad code even after a user leaves the page, which is basically abusing service worker to work in the background. Now he goes to dis disprove this basically by saying that, well, you First of all, this paper doesn't include any examples. They reference the research paper, which seems to be quite shady, to be honest. And um, then he says, okay, so there's like, okay, so let's see what can we do. So there's like events like fetch, push, or sync, or message, right? For a majority of those, you actually have to be on the page. And if it's a push notification, you have to show, so you will, the user will see the message, which doesn't make it secretly in the background. Um, so if you ever read that article, make sure to read the more detailed explanation. That seems to be like a bit of a bonkers. And the Mozilla team also replied to the article saying that this actually doesn't make sense. <laughs> okay, next thing we got here is the announcement from Mozilla Hacks team. Uh, there is a new management structure for ECMA TC39 committee, which now will comprise of people from PayPal, Microsoft, Mozilla, and Google which is kind of neat. And um, yeah, we're, we're gonna see how that changes the whole process. Uh, hopefully it's gonna be more democratic and there will be less friction between, um, at least, you know, to some of the proposals, because I know that some of them, uh, at least reading the guys who try to submit 
proposals, even from Google Teams, were shut down just because some of the TC39 members didn't like some things in them. We'll see how that goes. All right, next thing we got here is um, a vague festification proposal just received TC39 blessing. So async functions are officially approved to be fast now. Um, there is a full proposal link here. It turns out that the sync functions are actually quite much slower than they could have been because there is some additional things that are currently done to sort of I backfill, I guess, the non-async things. And this basically gets wrapped into double promise, which makes it quite a bit slower than it could have been in the first place. So it is quite exciting. And we're going to see how that ends up. If you want to see more details, make sure to check out the proposal itself by Maya Lekova, which seems to be quite awesome. All right, next thing we got here is understanding the spread operator in JavaScript. Those, this is for all of you people who are wondering what the three dots thing in JavaScript is. Spread operator is amazing. If you're already using it, you won't find anything new here. But if you don't know what it is, or if you wanted to learn about it, this is a very good tutorial. Next thing we got here is a terrifying look into Google Domains website. Um, despite that it's a recent redesign, it's still built using Google Web Toolkits. That is a Java thing. And it loads megabytes of JavaScript bundle, which is loaded by eval, which is compiled from Java. And it is about 230k lines of code and has Java code in there, which is absolutely terrifying. And <laughs> what, like, Again, you know, this is sort of the um, uh, dissonance in the Google teams. On one hand, you got the Google web developers teams that are absolutely amazing and delivering on stuff like, you know, Polymer web components, Google Chrome, and pushing a lot the web forward by making it leaner, faster, and nicer. On the other hand, you got teams that ship Google domains that is 230K lines of code and they're built from Java. Which is like, come on. <laughs> Come on, just this, this sometimes is just incredible. <laughs> All right, next thing we got here is the new ECMAScript proposal promise.any that short circuits when any of the input promises are fulfilled. So we already had all settled, all and race. And this is basically the only missing combinator for the promise land. It's really nice to see that it's basically, there's a proposal from it and seems like there's gonna be no friction and it's gonna be delivered quite quickly. Next thing we got here is uh, when you are using React hooks, turns out you can write a basic synchronous domless React hooks clone in just 26 lines of code. And you can add a bit more codes, just one line to actually have custom hooks, which is kind of incredible. So if you ever wonder how to build your own React, well, without DOM obviously and synchronous, but you know, in just 27 lines of code, do check it out, this is quite a, kind of cool what React hooks uh, allow you to do. All right, next thing we got here is uh, private class fields have been shipped in Chrome 64 and are now available in Chrome Canary for testing out. So if you wanted to try out new class private fields, you can now do this. The um, There's already a lot of jokes going around about hashtagging your fields. Um, so yes. Um, <laughs> I mean, that, that's, that's awesome news. And I guess we're going to get that in stable in a couple of months and uh, maybe in Node.js in like three, four, five months, half a year. I don't know. We'll see. But yeah, it's quite exciting. All right. Uh, next thing we got here is a new RFC for React, uh, RFC for focus management that basically improves the focus management across the React components uh, by introducing the focus manager. Um, React input components is what I wanted to say allowing you to sort of manage it more precisely and improving, you know, accessibility and things like this. So if you're using uh, React, make sure to check it out. It is, again, RFC. Uh, we're going to see how that develops, but it looks quite interesting. All right. Next thing we got here is introducing package diff, a tool that allows you to visualize difference between two versions of NPM packages. Um, looks like this. Essentially, you can just see the yeah diff between tarballs of packaged versions to visually compare what the hell was changed, which actually seems extremely useful. There are examples, it's a website and you can literally just, you know, give it, uh, come on, where's my scroll bar? Give it two versions of packages and you will see the full diff of what was changed. So you can visually inspect that and decide if you wanna update or not, which is actually quite awesome. 
All right, next thing we got here, and I don't remember if that's the last thing, but it might be the last thing, is React Native Open Source Update from March 2019. It's a latest update from the React Native uh, team that outlines the work that is gonna be, um, they're, they're gonna be doing in the next few months, essentially. The release uh, of 0.59 that includes hooks is the sort of the milestone for the next few months. Uh, or I guess few weeks because it seems like they already released more than one release candidate and is just uh, miring out the bugs now and releasing it. So if you are working with React Native, make sure to check out the roadmap and see how it will develop. All right, uh, that is it for the short things. Now we got, well, we literally have only one release this week around, at least from what I have seen so far. It's HTM uh, version 2.1, where we talked about it today. It's a tiny library that allows you to write uh, JSX without JSX, essentially, uh, using uh, template uh, tag literals. And uh, now you can actually compile JSX to HTM using a nice tool that it provides. So if you are looking to migrate from JSX to HTM, now you can do it very easily. So do check it out. All right, uh, that is it for the releases. Now we got the libraries and demos section. And the first thing I want to announce here today is, well, there's the .dev domains are now uh, publicly available and I was able to actually buy bxjs.dev. So all the podcast stuff is now living here. All the, well, basically all the bxjs stuff is now living here. All the links, all the weekly episodes. And um, I actually <clears throat> should continue working on a website because we wrote that scraper that scrapes all the links. And we now have a pretty big database of scrape things with, you know, articles and full text and tags and everything. So we can actually do some data science in here. Uh, but yeah, basically you can just find all the links at bxjs.dev now. Here's the latest episode 51. I think it still haven't updated it because, um, yeah, because probably the update hasn't triggered the re-render. Uh, Vim dev, yes, Vim dev is a thing. Somebody bought it and redirected to Emacs. There is, there's been also v, v3 schools.dev that redirects to Mozilla Developer Network, which is also great. There's a lot of those domains now and all of them are great, but nonetheless, okay, let's continue. So next demo we got here is zero server, zero configuration web framework that allows you to really quickly start uh, developing things. Um, essentially, you just install it and then you start it and it uses file system as API. So you can create either HTML or express endpoints or JSX or MDX or Markdown or just, you know, oh yeah, it also has the auto install from dependencies. It seems very nice for prototyping and this sort of seems to be the main use case. It is open source, you can just see it on GitHub. Uh, for some reason, GitHub says that majority of code is Python, don't trust it, it's actually majority of it is JavaScript and Node.js. It has the Python runner planned for the future, but for now it just you know works with whatever I've shown you. There is a quite amusing discussion on Hacker News for it as well, um, specifically a file-based routing and automatic dependency resolution. Someone found the dependency from 90s, um, sorry, dependency, uh, can't damn it. Security vulnerability from 90s is what I want to say. And you could actually get the ATC password file from it by yes, getting that, which was already patched. But you know, this is why you shouldn't use it for production essentially. As a test server, that seems to be actually very nice. So do check it out. Next thing we got here is Buefi. Lightweight UI components for Vue.js based on Bulma. Uh, seems very nice. So if you are working with Vue.js and wanted some Bulma components but didn't want to you know, use CSS for some reason, this seems to be quite nice and uh, even has some extended things like date picker and switch and all the other stuff, which looks very good. So yeah, if you're working with Vue, do check it out. Next thing we got here is confirmation, a simple node tool to replicate browser confirm dialog on your CLI. Essentially, um, UI dialog in the CLI that is clickable with the mouse as well as interactable with the keyboard. So if you ever wanted to have a fancy dialog for some reason, do check it out. I personally think that just, <laughs> just a simple text is enough usually, but there you go. All right, next thing we got here is Macaca.js. This is a solution for automation tests with ease. Um, it actually seems very impressive. I didn't have time to dig into it, but 
It allows you to uh, simulate quite a lot of user interactions and it also has uh, front end, sort of you can simulate the web, you can simulate the iOS, Android, whatever. And it literally loads the, um, in this case, the iOS simulator and then interacts with the app, which looks pretty damn impressive. And all of that is open source. And uh, yeah, there is, where is the, um, they have a list of supported cross, no wait, they had a list of supported things, features. Where was it? I, th I Like last time I saw the list of supported things that you can actually run, but whatever. So if you are, if you are um, into test automation and if you're working with the UI uh, packages, do check it out. This seems to be pretty cool. Ah, there we go. There it is. So there is the yeah UI tests, mocking, app inspector, so on and so forth. Seems to be quite advanced actually. Right, continuing, we got Nexus DI, a simple and powerful IOC container for JavaScript without the tiers. So dependency injection for JavaScript. Um, I, I don't know, it's been quite a while since I needed any dependency injection, but maybe you do, so do check it out if this is the case. Um, I mocked my app with that. We can track with the native API. Oh, that's actually very neat. Cool, thanks for the heads up. Uh, what was your overall experience? Tell the chat, I would love to know that. Meanwhile, we got Electron Menu Bar, boilerplate for Electron Menu Bar application with Popover, React, and Webpack. So it looks like this and works on all the platforms, meaning Mac OS, Linux, and Windows. Seems quite nice. So if you ever wanted to do an app that would have, um, you know, pop over from the menu, do check it out. This seems to be a nice boilerplate. Next thing we got here is Lo-Fi, mini Spotify player with visualizations built on top of Electron. So if you are <clears throat> curious about how to do that, you can just look at the source code. If you ever wanted a minimal player that basically looks like this for your Spotify, then well, you can use that one. And uh, yeah, for some reason it's not built for Linux. I'm not sure, maybe Spotify is not available in Linux. It's a good question, but there you go. All right, next thing we got here is unstated props. A tiny wrapper that provides access to your unstated containers from component props. I've seen a lot of people do that essentially uh, for their unstated stuff. You know, you write a wrapper that essentially passes your unstated containers as props. And this, this library just do this for you. So you just connect your unstated containers into props and then wrap your um, component with containers and that's basically it. So very straightforward, very simple, made save you a few bytes. Next thing we got here is React Robohash, a React wrapper for Robohash Orc, which is a random image generator. You just give it some hash and it gives you a nice image. That's basically all it does. It even has cats. So if you wanna generate random cats, you can do that. Um, yeah, that's, that's basically all it does. Next thing we got here is AR kit or R kit. I'm not sure how you pronounce that correctly. It is a tool that visualizes JavaScript, TypeScript, and flow code bases and minim meaningful committable architecture diagrams that basically look like this. Uh, this is the yeah, very complex one. Uh, maybe you need something like that. I personally don't know if I would use that. That looks very, I mean, if my app would be that complex, I would probably start splitting it very quickly, but um, there you go. Yeah, maybe you want that, it looks quite nice. Next thing we got here is VS Code Peacock extension that colorizes your color, um, colorizes your color, no, colorizes your VS Code workspaces so that you can distinguish the instances by color when switching between them. So essentially it changes this bar color. So when you alt tab from one VS Code instance to another, you can easily see where you are. Quite nice if you are, uh, you know, working with a lot of instances at the same time. Next thing we got here is GPU.js, a GPU accelerated JavaScript, or to be more precise, GPU accelerated mathematics that allow you to create the GPU kernel to run uh, mathematical computation, you know, basically whatever the GPU does actually good, matrix computation and stuff like this on the GPU. And it is impressively good. There are still seems to be some bugs. I'm not sure if they're related to Mac OS specifically because a lot of people in the comments to this was complaining that um, it actually hanged their Mac uh, MacBooks, only very specific versions of it. But uh, for me, it worked perfectly fine. And uh, if we just, uh, I'm sorry, I have to enable JavaScript, I believe, or was it the 
Load on save scripts. I think this is what I wanted to know. Okay. Uh, yeah, there you go. Maybe that's what he wants. There we go. Okay. So the the difference in the performance is actually incredibly uh, impressive. So this is running in a default mode as in the, uh, it benchmarks the normal approach versus the GPU approach. As you can see here, the CPU approach is on average 0 0.37 seconds, which is okay. GPU approach is about 4.5 times faster. Now, if you enable the texture mode, which makes it even faster, the difference becomes absolutely insane. Uh, bear in mind, this is a gaming rig, so it has a pretty powerful GPU, so the numbers for your machine might differ, but uh, this essentially runs on 1070, um, and yeah, 67.5 times faster, which is mind-blowing. So if you need to do any GPU accelerated, comp or I guess any mathematical computations in JavaScript, you might as well do them on GPU, because this seems to be working quite nicely. All right, next thing we got here is React Circular Input, the very basic circular input for React that allows you to do this. Maybe you wanted that, do check it out. Next thing we got here is 30 seconds of knowledge. Uh, this is an extension for Chrome that um, replaces your new tab and shows you snippets for different things, languages, technologies uh, that are interview questions that basically help you improve before your interview. Maybe you wanted that. I personally prefer my tab to be blank, but you know, maybe you find it helpful. Next thing we got here is Polka Dot from Miss Luke Edwards. This is the core of Polka. It is even faster, even smaller, if you can imagine that. And uh, yeah, even simpler basically. So uh, if you ever wanted a server that is smaller than Polka, now you can have it with Polka Dot. There you go. <laughs> All right, next thing we got here is tight MS package, a tiny millisecond conversion utility that allows you to convert string into milliseconds. That's quite handy. So if you ever needed to do that, um, do check it out. Essentially seems to be very nice. I believe it doesn't really have any dependencies. Not to be lying as it doesn't have any dependencies and it is probably, probably very, very small. We might as well just check it. Um, package for the uh, MS. It's probably, yeah, seven kilobytes. There you go. So very tiny. All right, continuing, we got wait for localhost. Wait for localhost to be ready essentially just asks the whatever port on localhost you want and waits for the server to be up and respond with 200. Very straightforward. Next thing we got here is Piney Pig or Piney Pig. I'm not sure how to read that. It's uh, Another one of the very performant web frameworks that is easy for developers. Uh, if you thought the Fastify was not fast enough for you, then Pinny Pig is about two times faster, which is damn impressive to be honest. And it's essentially, you know, more or less the same way as just about any other server. Um, also has a nice CLI that basically generates the app for you and works without CLI, uh, has the route set up, router integrated and everything. So yeah, seems quite nice. I mean, if you wanted to go very fast, do check it out. Next thing we got here is Pika Web package uh, that allows you to install and run uh, NPM dependencies directly in the browser without browser five webpack or import maps required. Essentially, uh, you just change your imports from you know package name to web module slash package and then run uh, run Pika Web uh, thingy command line and it just works. So there's some magic in the background. So if you are uh, working with web components to check it out, this seems to be quite nifty. Next thing we got here is npm f, fetch quick info about npm package from terminal, literally just run f and then package name and it shows you sort of a summary about the package. It's basically all it does, um, maybe useful for some cases, I don't know. Next thing we got here is Autonumeric, a standalone library that provides live as you type formatting for international numbers and currencies. Actually, it looks very nifty and very impressive. There's a website for it. And uh, yeah, there is like a bunch of options for that. And all of that is very nicely formatted on the go as you type, which is kind of neat. Next thing we got here. Oh, yes, this is probably one of my favorite ones. Defender of the Fev icon. Now, um, so here's the thing. This is a demo that implements Space Defenders in Fev Icon. If you, if, you can, if you can notice it, it is actually animated over there 
And uh, wait a second, is there like a mag magnifier tool, right? So we can we can probably do this. There you go. Um, I probably want even even bigger magnification. There you go. You can probably see it right now. Now here's the thing. If I press N right now, oh, I'm not there. So if I press N right now, wave one. There we go. We can. Um, I because of the mouse, I cannot see. Like yes, there we go. So we can we can play stuff. I it's. <laughs> I, I don't know who decided it was a good idea, but that's the thing. You can play a game inside of Fav Eco, and it actually works. I <laughs> There's a source code as well, so if you're curious how that was made, do check it out. It is painful to watch, it is silly as hell, but it is quite fascinating that you can actually do that. <laughs> um, but yeah, that that's that's the thing. That's that's the thing. That that's I don't know what to say about that anymore. You know what? Let's just continue. So next thing, yeah, this one is actually really cool. Microsoft uh, open source the whole front end bootcamp workshop that they have to the GitHub. So if you actually was curious about how the front end bootcamp looks in Microsoft, all the learning materials are now on GitHub and you can just have a look, go through them yourself and basically go through the whole bootcamp on your own. Uh, it seems to cover quite a lot of topics, including Redux, TypeScript, Jest, and a bunch of other stuff, which is kind of awesome. You know, it, it's really great that they did that. So there you go. Next thing we got here is JavaScript tips and tidbits, a continuously evolving compendium of JavaScript tips based on common areas of confusion and misunderstanding. Essentially the repo that aims to uh, clarify the common pitfalls and mistakes and confusions that exist in JavaScript, like uh, value and reference, variable assignment, closures, destructing, and so on and so forth. So if you're still confused about some of those areas, make sure to check it out. The explanations are actually quite good. Next thing we got here, yes, another one of those super terrifying demos. So it's called CSS FPS and it's a demo of a CSS powered 3D environment. Geometry is created with HTML elements and CSS transforms. Textures and light maps are composed by layering multiple background images and color is applied using CSS blend modes. So someone decided it was a good idea to make a 3D engine using CSS. So this is pure CSS and there is no WebGL or anything like this. It's just CSS transforms, images and bitmaps. And uh, yes, you can like, you know, if you go close enough, it all starts breaking. But the fact that this exists and the fact that you can walk around, you can jump is <laughs> a bit mind blowing. Um, there is, at least I couldn't find any repo, but you can do, you know, view source and the source is quite nice there. So you can just um, check out how it was made essentially. It is a bit silly as well. Right, that is it for the libraries and demos. Now I got a bunch of interesting and silly stuff. The first one for today is an article called my Git aliases. So if you're using Git, make sure to read this one through because there are some really helpful aliases. And even though I've been using Git for the past, I don't know, 15 years or something, I was able to find aliases that I found to be useful and thought like, hmm, why didn't I think about that before? Um, there you go. Next thing we got here is noclip.website. Uh, this is really cool demo that allows you to inspect a lot of uh, levels from older 3D games right in your browser. Um, why is it, there you go. Just taking a bit of time to load. So uh, there you go. There's, for example, a level from Super Mario Galaxy 2 that you can just explore and, uh, you know, fly around and just uh, have a look in your browser, which is kind of awesome. And uh, there's like a bunch of games from GameCube, uh, GameCube, no, GameCube, Nintendo 3DS, Dark Souls Collision Data. I have no idea what this is. That is actually a big ass file. I Is it like a first Dark Souls level? Like the whole first Dark Souls, essentially. Is that what it is? Holy sh it, it really is. Okay, this is literally the map of the first Dark Souls. This is impressive. So I guess it's just the collision data, but nonetheless, this is really cool. Yeah, so there you go. If, if you ever wanted to observe something like this in your browser, now you can actually do it. There's the statistics and um, viewer settings. You can even increase field of view. This is kind of neat. Um, yeah, there you go. Uh, next thing we got here is this uh, pretty accurate comparison of zero versus null versus undefined. I think this is possibly one of the best comparisons and explanations I've seen so far. So there you go. Next thing we got here is the defensive API design uh, by, um, so the 
defense here is in wrapping your global object in proxy. And whenever someone tries to call set on that global object, you just uh, execute shutdown with uh, tell app system events to shut down. Yes, uh, very defensive, not modifying globals. Uh, I, <laughs> I'm kind of tempted to add this to one of my apps. <laughs> All right, and the last thing we got here today is this cursed CSS tip that shows you how to put the scroll bar uh, from the right side to the left side using transform rotate, which is, <laughs> I don't know why would you do that, but this is absolutely silly. Right, this is basically it. This is all I have for today. Um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to throw them into the chat right now. If not, as usual, thank you very much for watching. Thank you for your continued support. As usual, you can find all the links on the GitHub, on the bxjs.dev website as well, once it updates after the two days built. Um, yeah, that's basically it. If you want to discuss any of this, feel free to join our Discord server. Um, if you have anything to share, feel free to send it my way using Twitter, Discord, whatever the hell. Yes, uh, thank you for your support. Thank you for watching as always. Uh, have a uh, good... Um, let, me <laughs> let me try this again. Have an awesome rest of the weekend or rest of the week if you're watching this later on. And I see you for the development stream on the Wednesday. We have to finally do this. I mean, we have so much awesome data for BXJS Weekly now. We got to um, continue with that website. And I see you for the next podcast next Saturday. So have a blast. Bye.